if all the boys and girls could come to the front on my left your right our children's story will be given to us today by sister Jalisa Happy Sabbath, little brothers and sisters. Happy Sabbath, bigger brothers and sisters. Who would like to open up with a word of prayer for us? Come. Hello, Lord. Tell us to listen. Learn something about you. Amen. Amen. All right, so I was thinking, oh, what am I going to tell to these little ones? And so I decided to tell two little stories, right? One is about me and one is not about me, okay? So here's the story about me. Quick question, have you ever did something that you shouldn't have done before? Right? No? Praise the Lord. Amen. Have mommy and daddy ever told you to do something and you didn't listen? And then you get in trouble, yeah? Or what about like you do something and you know you're gonna get in trouble? Are you afraid to tell mommy and daddy? Right, right, so here's the story. When I was like seven, maybe, yeah, maybe I was seven, I had a little baby sister and she was so cute, and I just loved to play with her. She had a big, round apple head and, you know, and a small little body, and she was just the cutest little thing. Well, one time, my mommy and daddy left, and they left us with our bigger cousins, and we, I was watching my little sister. Now, I used to live in New York, and New York is a dangerous city. And so my daddy would have a big metal bat. You guys know what a bat is? Okay, he would have this metal bat. And he would hide it behind his bed just in case anything happened. He can take his bat out to protect his family. So we knew he had this bat. And so whenever they would leave, we would take out the bat and play with the bat. So I was playing with the bat, and I, I had it between my legs, and I was kind of going like this, tossing it from hand to hand. But guess what? My little sister, my cute little sister, was sitting in her car seat right in front of me. And so what do you think happened? The bat fell out of my hand and hit her right in the nose. Now what do you think happened? She started to cry. Now, the parents were at home, so I didn't get in trouble at first, right? But I knew something bad was gonna happen to me. I knew that I was gonna get a spanking. And so, what do you think I did? No, no, well, yeah, I did. I put the bat away. I learned my lesson. I put the bat away. I didn't tell my mommy and daddy because they were at home, and I didn't want to get in trouble. And so I hushed my little sister, held her until she kind of went to sleep, and I thought, whew, no one will ever know what happened. Now, that's not the truth. The angels are recording every little thing, right? But there's this little word called guilt. Have you ever heard of the word called guilt before? Where when you do something wrong and you feel really bad and it weighs on you, and it was like this dark weighing feeling and it just bothered me so much. And so eventually, I had to tell mommy and daddy. And what do you think happened? Yes, I got a spanking. So that's what not to do. What not to do is when you do something wrong, you don't Hold it to yourself because you start to feel guilty, you're afraid of the consequences, and you don't tell your mommy and daddy. Because this is the story that I'm going to now tell you of what you should have done. A story of a little boy, he had a bat and a ball, and he was playing in his house. And you shouldn't play ball in the house. And so what do you think happened? <laughs> he hit something and it broke a nice vase that his daddy really liked. And his auntie was home. 
And his auntie was like, wait until your dad comes home. When your father comes home, you're going to get it. And what do you think the little boy said? Any idea? No, right? He said, my daddy's not like that. I'm really sorry for what I did. And so my daddy's going to forgive me. She said, if I was your daddy, I would give you a spanking. I wouldn't forgive you at all. Right? And she's like, my daddy, w my daddy wouldn't do that. And every time he heard a car pass, he ran to the door. Is that daddy? He was so excited for his daddy to come home. Not like my story, where I was afraid to see my parents. And his, his auntie was like, why are you so excited to see your daddy come home? And he was like, because my daddy's going to forgive me. And so finally, his daddy comes home. And he runs to his daddy and he says, Daddy, I'm so sorry. And he's like, what, boy? And he takes him and he shows him the vase. And he said, I was playing ball in the house. I knew I shouldn't have been playing ball in the house. And I broke the glass. And I'm sorry, I wouldn't do it again. And his father said, you suffered enough. I forgive you. So they walk out of the room. And what do you think the auntie was doing? The auntie was like, you're not going to give him a spanking? You're not going to yell at him? And you know what his father said? In this house, we must go into the sunshine as fast as possible. And so the truth is, because he recognized that what he did was wrong, he didn't hide it from his father, and he went straight to his daddy. He forgave him. Well, that's the same thing with our parents and with our Heavenly Father. We have rules that we should follow, and sometimes we don't listen. And sometimes we try to hide the things that we do. But if we go to our parents and ask for forgiveness, we may have to suffer the consequences. But he'll, we'll, you'll, be, you'll be forgiven, and you can get out of the darkness of guilt and get into the sunshine. And so I want to read a scripture for you. It's a scripture that I was meditating upon all day yesterday. I'm studying the book of First John, and it's a beautiful scripture. And it says, it's First John chapter 1, and it's verse Step five. It says, Then this is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. And so when we do something wrong, go to our Father of light, and he'll forgive us, and we can be into the sunshine. Amen? Who would like to close out in prayer for us? You sure? Okay, you could come. Dear Lord, just keep on safe, keep everyone safe, keep on safe, keep Daddy safe, keep everyone safe, keep the blessing safe, keep in the Lord's name, amen. Amen. And Father, we thank you that you are a forgiving God, and it's your power of forgiveness is why we are here. Help my little brothers and sisters know that when they do something wrong, they can come to their loving parents for forgiveness. And as they grow older, they can come constantly to you to receive forgiveness and cleansing from all sin. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, let us stand for our scripture reading. It will be taken from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. Again, that's Matthew, chapter 5, verses 43 and 44. And we will read them together. And it reads, Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And may the Lord add a blessing to the readers, the hearers, and the doers of his word. You may be seated. Our special music will be given to us today by Danella Taylor and friends, and then 
Thereafter, the next voice you hear will be that of the one who has been chosen to break the bread of life, Brother Gladstone. I pray that you will pray that the Lord will use this manservant. Amen. Good morning, church. The song that we're going to sing this morning is entitled, I Then Shall Live. And I pray that you are blessed um, by the words of this song. shall with honor 
Can you hear me? <clears throat> Can you hear me? Thank you so much for that beautiful hymn meditation. Before we get started, I want to share a story with you. I heard this story last, about last week or so. I won't share the whole story, but I want to share with you just parts of it that, uh, that go along with what I want to share with you today. Is that okay? All right. It's about a man, a Muslim man who becomes a Christian. Isn't that something? He was born in an Orthodox Muslim family in the Middle East. Uh, many people gave much respect uh, to his family because his father did great things in the community. So those in, who lived there looked up to the family. Um, at seven years old, his father sent him to the mosque to learn uh, of the Quran. At a young age, he learned most of the book. And his father said a wonderful a statement to him that really stuck with um, him. He said that education can get you to heaven, but Islam can. And so this thought pattern was in this young man's mind as he went and studied the Quran. He came to a point at nine years old where he, he, he memorized the whole book in Arabic, the original language. He also learned English and he was able to do public speaking in his community. People started to look up to him, this young man. At 14, he began to work at his uncle's shop. He began to work with his uncle at his shop. And he was cleaning the, he was cleaning the shop and he found something in the trash can. It was a, a pamphlet, a Christian pamphlet. And so he picked it up out of the trash can, thinking that, you know what, I need to read what they believe so I can debate them, have something to fire back, on, fire back and use it to their to a disadvantage to win them. But he had too many questions. He began to doubt what he believed. He got a Bible to read and compare to the Quran. And he said, and he began, as he began studying and reading, he said this statement, he said, somehow the scriptures were drawing me to a love of Jesus and I felt a passion to serve him. The words from the Bible were also with me as if a person were also with me. I realized that the punishment could be if, I realized what the punishment could be if I forsook Islam for Christianity. But my heart was filled with the peace and joy as if I was going to explode. He began to talk with his friends about what he was learning to see what his thoughts were. His friends began to tell others about what he was going through, about his studies, and it began to persecute him, say things to him, tell him to, to stop what you're doing. Then one day he found a Christian teacher who helped him understand spiritual things. He taught him how to study the Bible. At this point, he fully gave his heart to God. He became a Christian. At age 15, the parents heard about it and called the Muslim authorities. They found the young man and beat him so bad his chin was split open and that his blood was throughout his whole, all his clothes he was wearing. His parents threw him out of the house. Years have gone by and he grew to miss his family. He wanted to see them again to see his mom, his father, his brothers and sisters, to spend time with them. He was a family man. One day after leaving church, he was walking down the sidewalk, and his, <coughs> his brother saw him walking and said, hey, we miss you, we miss you. And, li and likewise, in return, he, the young man said, I miss you too. And he invited him, hey, come, mom wants to see you. She, she misses you. She wants you to come. Come tonight. Come tonight. And so... Man was, he wanted to go, but he went back to his teacher, the one who was his um, guidance, his spiritual counselor. And he told him, look, I saw my brother. I want to see him again. You think I should go? And the guy said, the, the, the spiritual counselor said, I, I think it would be good for you. I think you need to be careful. But if they're asking you to come, just when you go, don't say anything that will cause any disruption. 
And so he went. And then when the mother saw him, she welcomed him with open arms. She was happy to see him. The family, everyone came and gathered around him and said, wow, it's good to see you. The mother cooked all the food that he loved since growing up. The best food. It was a welcome. Nobody asked him to come back to Islam. No disruptions were happening. They were just smiling. And they placed him before this table of the food that he enjoyed so much. With the family he missed so much. He sat down and began partaking of the food that he hadn't had in a long time. And suddenly, he became very ill. His arms and legs prickled and became numb. Blood began to run out of his nose and his body began to convulse in pain. The family poisoned him because he had been a bad example. He finally got enough energy and must mustered up and left the situation. He ran out of the house and he waved down a car and the car stopped. And it could have been it could have been a Muslim, it could have been this person, it could have been that person, but when the person stopped, he noticed that in a, the rearview mirror, uh, mirror, he saw the cross. And he said, what is your name? And the man said, Peter. And usually your names are dictating where your culture, your, uh, your religion. But it was Peter. He was a Christian. And he said, I'm a Christian. He said, wow, I'm a Christian too. Let's go. And he told him what happened. He took him to the hospital. And on the way to the hospital, he was saying this as I close with the story. He says, I'm willing to die for Jesus. And the man said, no, you're not. No, it's not time yet. We're going to get you to the hospital. But he kept, he kept on saying, I'm willing to die for Jesus. After that, he said, how could they do this to me? It's all with his family. But after that, he said, God, forgive them. And he goes on to say, please, please pray for my family. And so he already forgave his family. And he went on and got healed. The story continues even more so, but I want to just bring out that point right now. This is happening around the world. People being persecuted for what they believe in. Persecuted on different levels. We probably haven't experienced this level yet, but one day it will come. But before I continue, I want to pause here and pray. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly come before you. As we delve into your word, Lord, please speak to us. Soften our hearts and help us to hear your voice. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're going to read verse 12. It says, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. My question is to you, did Jesus suffer persecution? Did he suffer persecution? Yes? Yes, he did. And it says here, this text is telling me that if we live godly in Christ Jesus, if we live the same life as Christ lived on this earth, we too will suffer persecution. Whether you believe it or not, whether you do something wrong or not, because you live for God, you will suffer persecution. But not only that, the young man in the story, his name is Hafiz. He did something else in the midst of persecution. He forgave in the midst of persecution and suffering. We know that Jesus is our example. It says that in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21, that Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. One of my favorite quotations found in Ministry of Healing, page 365, it says that Jesus Christ, Jesus came to this earth to accomplish the greatest work ever accomplished among men. He came as God's ambassador to show us how to live so as to secure life's best results. 
life's best results. If we want to be where Jesus is, which is in heaven, we must live the life he lived on earth. He is our example. He came to show us how to live. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to begin in verse 5. It says, Let this man be, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. In verse 8, it says, And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we find, we see that he humbled himself. He became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He is our example. Humility is key. He left the joys of heaven and chose his home in a cold and thankless world. He went through the agony in the garden of Gethsemane, sweating, blood, sweating drops of blood, praying for you and me. He partook of the cup of suffering so that we can partake of the cup of blessing. Isn't that something? He partook the cup of suffering so that we can partake of the cup of blessing. We don't deserve that cup. We deserve the cup that Christ took. But praise God, he partook it for us. After this, still, he was betrayed with a kiss. A kiss usually symbolizes love, affection, happiness, and joy. But this time, it was betrayal. Betrayal. How often do we give words of love, actions of love, but our hearts are far from it? You can smile today, but in your mind, you hate this person. You, you think negative towards this person. He was then hurried in the night to a judgment hall to be commend, condemned to death by sinful mortals. He was then hurried in the night. It couldn't happen in daytime, but it happened in the night. We fast forward. Pilate knew better, but chose his position over Christ. Christ. Pilate knew better, but he chose his position over Christ. He is the majesty of heaven. He had wore the crown of glory. But now we see him bleeding, wearing a crown of thorns. And to make the death of Jesus as shameful as possible, two thieves were crucified with him, one on each side. They gave Christ a cross to bear. And it wasn't light. It wasn't light. And he had to bear this cross. And at every step was left blood which followed from his wounds. The bitter, the murderous crowd was ignited by Satan, taunting him as he walked by, jeering and mocking. Finally, when they got there, it was time to put them on the crosses. The thieves resisted their arms from being stretched out, but Christ meekly submitted. He needed, not, he needed no one to force his arms back upon the cross to be nailed. Heaven viewed with grief and amazement. The angels who hovered over the scene of Christ's crucifixion were moved to indignation as the rulers derided him. They wished their to come to rescue of Jesus and deliver him, but they were not suffered to do so. Why? The object of his mission was not yet accomplished. On the cross, he saw this taking place. He saw the mindsets. He heard the words being thrown. He saw the gambling, the taunting, 
the anger. But his mind, his mind passed from his own suffering to the sin of his persecutors and the terrible retribution that would be theirs. Had they known that they were putting the uh, putting to torture one who had come to save the sinful race from eternal ruin, they would have been seized with remorse and horror. As he looked down, he saw, there stood men formed in the image of God, joining to crush out the life of Christ, formed in the image of God. No curses were called down on the soldiers who were handling him roughly. No vengeance invoked on the priests and rulers. But something was said. Turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23. We're going to zero in on verse 34. We're talking about forgiveness in the midst of suffering. Jesus says and cries out these words, Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. And not just them. He's talking about us too as we crucify him. You know, the Bible says in Hebrews 6, 6, that we crucify him afresh. We crucify, we crucify him afresh every time we sin against God. Every time we disobey God. Every time we know to do right, but we do wrong. We sin against God. We crucify him afresh. Desire of Ages, page 300, brings out this point. The Spirit reveals the in ingratitude of the heart that has slighted and grieved the Savior and brings us in, contri in uh, contrition to the foot of the cross. But every sin, Jesus is wounded afresh. By every sin, Jesus is wounded afresh. And as we look upon him whom we have pierced, we mourn for the sins that have brought anguish upon him. Such mourning will lead to the uh, renunciation of sin. Again, what a sight for the heavenly universe to witness someone who's sinless, someone who's guiltless, to go through this. And I ask the question to you, could you forgive in the midst of suffering, in the midst of persecution, brothers and sisters? I ask that right now. Not after the fact, but in the midst of it, during it. While they talk about you, while they lie about you, while they do all these things in the midst of it, can you still forgive them? I remember a couple years ago, there was an elderly lady that I would see every day. I would go there almost every day, see what she needed. I would give her rides. She would need a ride to go to the church, uh, bank, the store, even rides out of town such as Chattanooga, Atlanta, even far as Miami. But I took her. Of course, she has children, but they, and they live right next door, but yet they never came, but only when they needed something. And so I was like a child to her. And my love for her grew every day. And I was wondering why the children never came and helped their mother. I remember one day our, at our church, a Bible seminar was taking place. And they're very limited on the, the booklets, but we all got one. And uh, we took it. A couple days passed by. I went to her house. And she said, oh, Where's my Bible lesson book? I don't, I don't have it. But she thought that I took her book. And she was very keen on, strong on that, that I had taken the book out of her house and used it for myself. And I was like, wow. At first I was like, wow, wow, what's going on here? I was kind of hurt by that. And but a week or two passed by. But she started telling people about this. She started telling people, this person took my book. I started getting calls. I said, what is this? So I went to the house, because I had mine, so I was gonna give her mine. I said, oh, um, here's, you can have my book. 
But when I went to the house, and I've already forgiven her already, but I went to the house, I offered my book to her. Um, she said, oh, I don't need it. I said, why? She said, oh, I found my book. But she didn't apologize, but it's fine. But I still forgave her. And there are many people who won't forgive unless uh, the person will come to them to ask for forgiveness. But we see that Christ asked for forgiveness of these on our behalf before they even came to it. And then later on in Acts chapter 1, we find that those, many of them gave their heart to God. But it may be small, but it's still a form of persecution where you're just, you're just doing right. You're just living right. And yet still negative things happen. So I want to remind you of 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12, that those who live godly will suffer persecution. It says, so it, will be unto you, so it will be with all who live godly in Christ Jesus. Persecution and reproach await all who are imbued with the spirit of Christ. The character of the persecution of Christ the character of the persecution changes with the times, but the principle, the spirit that underlies it, is the same that has slain the chosen of the Lord even since the days of Abel. And so if we're going to live the life of Christ, this will happen. And I want you to know something. Everything that Christ did, he taught. And everything he taught, he did. This is what gave power to his words. This is what gave power to his life because he lived by example. And I want you to know something also. If pastors actually preached only what they lived, there would be far less sermons. Far less sermons. And so that, become, that comes to our scripture reading in Matthew chapter 5. Let us go there. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus is speaking here to his disciples. He says, Matthew 5, verse 43 and 44. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and, have, and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. And goes on, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for ye maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and send it to reign on the just and on the unjust. You see, it's easy to love someone who loves you. But it's a whole other thing to love someone who hates you. Who talks about you. Who's negative towards you all the time. It's hard. It, I mean, it's real. It's hard. But instead of talking and talking and talking, we need to talk less and pray more. There is more talk about people's faults and far less prayer lifted up for them. I see that. There's far less talk. There's more talk than praying. Let's turn to Matthew 7. Matthew 7, we're going to read 1 through 5. I'm very familiar, but let's just turn our eyes on it. It says, Judge not that ye not be judged. For with, for with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye met it shall be measured to you again. And why beholdest thou the, more, the mote that is in the brother's eye, but considers not the beam that is in thine own eye? Or how wilt thou say to thy brother, let me pull out thy mote of thy eye, and behold, a beam is in my own eye? Goes on, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye, then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the moat out of thy brother's eye. So we must be careful what we say, what we think, and what we do. Instead of doing that, we are called to be ministers. Christ came not to minister, 
I mean, Christ came not to be ministered to, but to minister to others. And likewise, we are called to minister, to minister, or ministry, or administer, to give, or administration. There's something known as a Christian administration. Christian administration, because there's, certain, there's a certain way to deal with people. There's a certain way not to deal with people. And if we understand Christian administration, we will know what to do, because Christ did that as well. Let's turn to Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah 50, verse 4, you can write this down. It says, The Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. And so we see here that given means a gift. We can receive a gift only when we ask for it. If we want to know how to, what to say to people, how to talk to people, we must first ask for that gift. Because it has to be given to you. We're not born with it. And so the principle here is to know what to say to the right person at the right time. Say the right thing to the right person at the right time. And that's a gift. That's prayer. I say, I know what to say to that person. I know what to say to her. I know what to say to him. But it's the right time. Is the right person. Is what, you want, is what you want to say right? All three of that has to be together, and that takes prayer. It's Christian administration. And if we want to learn, we must learn from Christ. Christ, Christ dealt with all types of personalities. He didn't deal the same way with doubting Thomas to the sons of thunder. <laughs> we must know that. Now, Ministry of Healing, page 43, says this. Every association of life calls for the exercise of self-control, forbearance, and sympathy. We differ so widely in the disposition, habits, education, that our ways of looking at things vary. We judge differently. Our understanding of truth, our ideas in regard to the conduct of life, are not in all respects the same. There are no two whose experience is alike in every particular. The trials of one are not the trials of another. The duties that one finds light are to another most difficult and perplexing. I continue. So frail, so ignorant, so liable to misconception is human nature that each should be careful to the estimate he places upon another. We little know the bearing of our acts upon the experience of others. Here comes a key point here. All of it's key, but this is the most important. What we do or say may seem to us of little moment. When could our eyes be opened, we should see that upon it demanded the most important results for good or for evil. And so it's very important that we are mindful of what we say, how our content is, how we act around people, because it does something to them that you'll never know. There's a broader scope than what you see. And so this is unselfish ministry. This is how we have Christian administration and unselfish love, pure love. We just what we need. True love transcends selfish love. True love transcends the selfish love. This untested love. You know, love needs to be tested. Do you know that? Love needs to be tested. I remind him, praise and prophets. I'm reading it this every morning. And on page 53, it says that the tree of knowledge have been made a test of their obedience and their love to God. That tree was placed in their home, in the midst of the garden, in the center of it. Why? So that obedience can be tested, that their love can be tested. And once it's tested, brothers and sisters, that love will grow and grow and grow and grow. A lot of us don't like rain, but rain is necessary if we want our plants to grow. Flowers grow in, the, in times of rain, and we need rain in our lives. And so marriage tests love. Any relationship that you have tests love. And love 
and appre- love and appreciation grows. That's what's supposed to happen. But a lot of times, a, a lot of depreciation is taking place, and you can see it. A lot of times you can see it. The home is the foundation of society, of the church, of the community, the ministry. All the individuals are, come from homes. Every person here has come from a home. Even the President of the United States has come from a home. And our home brings us up. It, ha- it, it, it produces our character. It helps us to be molded in society based on where we are from. And that's what we're called to have our homes, especially when we have children in the country, somewhere where they can not be so bothered by the cumbersome and the rush and all the uh, distractions that the world has. I want you to know something, that God's love is tested every day. We do so many things that hurt God. (laughs) It's not even funny, but yet he still loves us the same way. Not even a millisecond or a moment, his love has changed. It is constant. It's constant. Nothing can change that. And that's the love that we need to have for ourselves, for, for each other. And it only grows up to that. It grows. And so because of his love, that's why I, pers- that's why I praise God for his grace. You know what? I praise God for his mercy. The Bible says that his mercy is new every day. His grace is sufficient for me, sufficient for you. Grace is not a license of sin, but rather it gives us the power to live righteously. Do we want to live righteously? But another thing I praise God for is his forgiveness, his love and kindness, but his forgiveness. There's so many times that I have crucified him afresh, but yet still, he has forgiven me. And I believe it by faith. The promises in the Bible show that he has forgiven me. Do you believe that? I met knocking on doors. Or I met people who actually believe they've gone too far. And the reason is because they did some sins that they thought was unforgivable. But God is here to forgive us. We have been deceived in this world. Satan is the only one who has who knew what he was doing from the beginning. He was not deceived. But everyone else has been deceived. But I want to give you three reasons why God would not God cannot forgive you. There are three reasons why he can't forgive. Number one, Psalm sixty six eighteen says, If we guard iniquity to my heart. If we hold on to known sin and yet still pray as though this sin is okay, then you can't forgive that. Number two, committed unpardonable sin or give the Holy Spirit blasphemy against the Holy, Holy Ghost Mark 39 29 but the third one which I want to zero in on he can't forgive you if you don't forgive those around you if you don't forgive someone how, what do you think he can forgive you and there's people that we have in our lives that maybe we haven't forgiven but the text says this in Matthew 16 in Matthew 6 let's turn there Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to read verse 14 and 15. Again, Jesus speaking this principle to his disciples. He says, For if ye forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if ye forgive not men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive you your trespasses. And again, Luke 6.37 says the same thing. It was a wonderful story. I'll just say it in brief. But there was a, there was a servant and, and, and a king. And a servant owned the ki- owed the king like a lot of money. But the king let him go. He had mercy on him. And then the servant went away and then found someone who owed him money and started beating him. And the man said, I don't have any money. Please have mercy on me. But the servant didn't give him mercy. Someone saw this. And went back to the king and said, look, the servant they gave mercy to is not giving mercy to the other servant who owed him money. The king was enraged and brought him back and put all the money back on him and even more so. And that story is, is significant because it shows that we must forgive as our father forgives. 
Surely if we see Jesus forgiving us, forgiving those persecutors on the, in the midst of suffering on the cross, we can forgive those who trespass us. Surely. We, we, <coughs> we read in Herald, August 2nd, 1881 says, The Son of God was rejected and despised for our sakes. Can you in full view of the cross beholding by the eye of faith the sufferings of Christ tell your foe tell your tale of woe your trials can you nurse revenge of your enemies in your heart while the prayer of Christ comes from his pale and quivering lips of his re, uh, of his revilers his murderers father forgive them for they know not what they do If there have been difficulties, brethren and sisters, if envy, malice, bitterness, evil surmisings have existed, confess these sins, not in a general way, but go to your brethren and sisters personally. Be definite. If you have committed one wrong and they 20, confess that one as though you were the chief offender. Take them by the hand. Let your heart soften under the influence of the Spirit of God and say, will you forgive me? I have not felt right toward you. I want to make right every wrong. That now, that not my stand registered against me in the books of heaven. I must have a clean record. Who, think you, will withstand such a movement of this? There is too much coldness and indifference, too much of the I don't care spirit exercised among the professed followers of Christ. All should feel a care for another, care for one another, jealously guarding each other's interest, love one another. Then we should stand a strong wall against Satan's devices. Amid the op opposition and persecution, we would not join the vindictive ones, not, un not unite with the followers of the great rebel whose special work is to accuse the brethren, to defame and cast stain upon their characters. I want you to know something that the Bible talks about how the sun should not go down on your wrath. Has anyone heard that before? What does that mean? The sun should not go down on your wrath. I, I hear things. I don't. I don't. What does it mean? Make resolutions before you go to sleep, right? Before the sunset. And those are statements in regards to the Sabbath, how things should be worked out before the Sabbath comes. Now I have a question for you. What if you've been slighted so bad that you don't want to do it? You don't feel to do it? You can't just get up and say, okay, I'm going to forget. It's, I mean, it's real. Emotions are real. And you feel that you're not, on that, you're not, on that, you're not there yet. What do you do? Okay. That's right. It's feeling, not faith. Well, let's go to a principle in Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. And we begin with verse 17. <coughs> Romans 4, 17. And to 21, it says, speaking of Abraham, it says, as it was written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. I want to zero in on verse 17 at the very end. It says, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead 
and calleth those things which be not as though they were. A lot of times, you know, the mind is, is, is very powerful. The mind is closely related to the body. And if your mind thinks you're sick, then your body will be sick, right? And so likewise, when you speak these words into existence, I forgive them, it, cha- it starts to change your, mo- your thought process. And so when you believe, it says here, according, it says, and call those things which be not as though they were. When you actually say these things, because they're not, but really because they are, it starts to change until you actually believe that. Because that's what you want. You can't always hate someone. You can't say, I hate this person. But if you say, I love this person, you start, your mind will change and you act according to that. But the principle is there. And so it's not about faith. It's not about feeling. It's about faith. Early writings talks about how faith and feeling are far as east and west. Don't go by your feelings. But what the Bible says, and if we do what the Bible says, like Abraham, we won't stagger with the promises of God. We won't stagger at all. But rather, verse 21 says, we will be fully persuaded. We'll be fully persuaded. And so we have that, those thoughts. You know what the word says, but you feel different. Just go by faith. And Lord will honor that. He knows your heart. He was touched. He is touched by the feelings of your infirmities. He knows what you're going through. He knows exactly what you're going through because it happened to him and much worse. And so, how many times should you forgive someone in a day? If I, if I were to work with Brother Cobb and I, and I messed up, I said something to him that, shouldn't, uh, that was out of, or, out of ordinary, and I asked for forgiveness, he'll forgive me. But if I keep doing it again and again and again and again and again, should he still forgive me? Three times. What well, the Bible says 70 times 70. <laughs> 70 times 70. And more than that. We see this principle in Matthew 18, 21 to 22. I remember I was helping someone make cookies. I never made cookies before. And so I was a, I was a learner. And I was there to learn and to be taught how to make cookies. It was, oh, it was chocolate chip cookies, sugar cookies, and peanut cookies all in one night and I didn't know what I was doing I kept messing up the person said what are you doing what are you doing da 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 no forgiveness messed up messed up messed up no forgiveness no forgiveness and I began to I came to a point I said wow I don't think I ever want to do this again not with this person and so but when you f- if that person were to forgive the first time it would have give it would have given me more enc- encouragement to do better you know it Forgiveness actually encourages people. It really does. But I want you to know something. Nobody, nothing, should separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. No situation, no person should separate you from the love of Christ. Let's turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Beginning with thir- verse 35, Romans 8, 35, it says, We shall separate, who shall separate us from the love of God Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or pearl, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accustomed, accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, all these things we are more than conquerors for, uh, through him that love us. Verse 38, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. We must be fully persuaded, as Abraham was. 
Nothing should separate us, not even persecution. If people talk about you, do things behind your back, whatever the case may be, it should not separate you from the love of God. And because we are together with God, we'll have, by God's grace, we'll have his character and principles flowing through us so that we can forgive in the midst of suffering. Nothing. Nobody. So that's why First Peter 4, 12 to 13 talks about count it not strange why these things take place in your life. Let's go there because there's a word I want to, there's a word there I'm missing. First Peter 4, verse 12 and 13, it says, Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice in inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceedingly joy. Jesus knows what you're going through. You may be going through, you may be going through something right now, some type of suffering or persecution, something that is not what you want to be taking place in your life. But I'm here to tell you that God knows what you're going through and he's with you. He feels you. He feels your pain. Hebrews 4, 15, and 16. Let's go there. As we begin to close here. Hebrews 4. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 and 16 in it. It says here, for we, ha for, we not, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly up unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Brothers and sisters, we can come boldly before Christ because he knows what it feels like to be persecuted boldly strongly praise God for his grace praise God for his mercy praise God for his forgiveness and I want to end with a story here in the early 1900s this is another story that I heard recently as well it's, it's, it's like powerful in the early 1900s one of the most horrible events in the world happened. The genocide of Rwanda. In that genocide, the Hutus battling against the Tutsis was taking place. And one million people were killed in less than nine months. At the same time, there were 380,000 there 380, Adventists living there. And at the end of the nine months, only 100,000 remained. Not because they were Adventists, but because they were in a minority, in a minority tribe, the uh, Tutsis. There was a woman named Abel, Adele, Adele Sihu. Her name was Adele Sihu. She was married to an Adventist pastor. The day that the announcement was made to start those killings, the pastor and the congregation, they ran to a church and hid in a basement. They hid in the basement. It was about 60 people altogether who was hiding in this basement. But sadly, the militia uh, saw that they were hiding there and went there and killed about 45 out of the 60 people there. But in regards to uh, Adele, she was, there were her and her husband holding hands. And out of nowhere, the people came into the basement and they came, they rushed over to her husband with machetes. Kill, they killed all the machetes and just started, then they destroyed him as she was holding his hand. After they were done with him, they cut, they, they struck at her her head, right here. They struck here, and they struck her. They wanted to cut off, and left her for dead. 
and she was there unconscious for three days. After three days, they was able to come in and try to bury the bodies. Um, they went to get her, but for some reason, they felt they needed to check her pulse, and they felt the pulse. After that, they took her to the hospital. She was in, out the, in and out of the hospital for three years. After these three years, stability started coming back into the country. And 18 prisons were built up. And they were used to, h to hold those that killed at that time. They had about 180,000 prisoners in 18 prisons. So after she came to realization, okay, she's l she felt better now. She's able to do stuff. She had, a decision, she had a decision that she was to make, whether to hold on to her bitterness or let go of her bitterness. And she thought about her husband. She said, my husband would want me to do, she said, my husband would want me to minister to the prisoners. And so she did. This, this is prison ministries. She went to the ministry, I mean, went to the prisons and the Bible studies with them. She brought blankets to them. She fed them. And one particular day, one day, a young man, she was doing her thing, and a young man out of nowhere came and fell at her feet and began to kiss her feet. She couldn't see who it was because the head was down there. But then he looked up and, s and asked her, do you remember me? And she couldn't forget the face of the person who took her husband's life, nor could she forget the one that did what they did to her. It was that person who was on her his knees asking, wait. And then he said, she said, yes, I never forgot the face of the attacker. They then asked, would you forgive me? The, pic the lady picked up the man and she said, yes, I forgive you. And after six months, he did the lessons, the Bible studies, and was baptized into the church. A couple years later, he was let out on amnesty. But yet, he was still a young man, and his parents died in, the, in the, what took place, and so he had nowhere to go. So the lady, Sister Adele, adopted him as her son and brought her, him in to her home and lived there. Isn't that something? One day when Jesus comes, all the suffering will be, all the suffering will be worth it. One day when Jesus comes, all the heartache will be worth it all. One day when Jesus comes, the burdens will be worth it all. And one day when Jesus comes, the past will be gone. And so what inspired her was a forward look. Jesus is coming again. Is there something in your heart now that needs to be dealt with? Is there bitterness in your heart? The forward look is what matters. There is nothing worth clinging to, not even bitterness. And so I imagine that her husband in heaven will see this young man who is completely changed. You know, Ministry of Healing brings out the point that Christianity will make a man a gentleman. And so this man has just completely changed, and he'll see, by God's grace, see her husband in heaven. And likewise, I think about all the persecuted Christians who will see Paul in heaven. They knew him as Saul, but when they see Paul, they'll say, wow, it's very real. Can you imagine her husband meeting his killer? But I ask you a question, what if she didn't have that forgiveness. What if there is no forgiveness? What would, what would be a different result? We don't know. But praise God for forgiveness. As we forgive those, he will forgive us. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we humbly come before your throne of mercy and grace. 
We thank you, Lord, for your son Jesus who came to die for us, who came to show us how to live. And he showed a principle that we must forgive those that trespass us. Please, Lord, help us. For we, our feelings are sometimes getting away. But help us to go by faith and to really do what we need to do, no matter what takes place. Help us to get rid of this pride that we have. Help us to do what we need to do to glorify you. Lord, we need you right now. We know that you're coming soon. So please, I pray that these principles will be in our hearts and instilled there day out and day in. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, Lord. We just ask that you may give us the strength that we need for today. We thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank Brother Gladstone for that message of forgiveness. Knowing that why would we withhold for forgiveness when our Father has forgiven us, Christ paid it all, that we might glorify him in all. Our closing hymn is forgiveness. In, I'm sorry, it is. Yeah, forgive our sins as we forgive. Number 299 in your hymnal. Let us stand. Number 299. Forgive our sins as we forgive. We're going to sing this hymn to the tune of 315. Oh, for a closer walk with God. And let us meditate on the words of this hymn as we sing. Two, three. Forgive. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm not sure
let us pray. Our Father, you have told us to love our enemies, bless them that curse us, to do good to them that hate us, to pray for those who despitefully use us and persecute us. So you have called us to a ministry of reconciliation, not retaliation. And this keeps us from taking the law into our own hands. By loving and praying for our enemies, we overcome evil with good. And by this, others will know that we are thine disciples. For no reason for us to hold, withhold forgiveness when we have been forgiven from above. Christ taking our place, that we might receive what we don't deserve as he received what he did not reserve. Yet, it's the king of the universe. Fill our hearts with your Holy Spirit as we depart from this place, never from your son. For it is in Jesus' name I pray. You may remain seated for a moment of silent meditation. And if you remain inside, let it be for prayer and meditation. You will be ushered out. 